What's up everybody? Gen X Dividend Investor here. A subscriber on my free dividend Discord server that now has over 5,000 dividend investors on it suggested that I run a series of polls to let people vote on their favorite stocks across each of the 11 sectors. And so far hundreds of votes have been cast and in this video I'm going to reveal the winners of the top 5 oil dividend stocks, aka energy dividend stocks, and then at the end of this video I'll share an inspirational story so stay tuned for that. When we think of energy, it bleeds into other sectors like utilities with Nextera Energy or consumer discretionary with Tesla's energy unit. So even though oil isn't an actual sector, I thought it made sense for this video. I wasn't planning on doing this video, but then I got a note from a subscriber who made an interesting point when he said, Hi, you need to do top 5 energy stocks next before they come back in a massive way. And then he joined my Discord and suggested it there as well because he wasn't sure which would be a better way to contact me. So Discord is the best real-time way to contact me, but it's also fine to DM me on Instagram. Now for context, I run a free dividend discord chat server which is listed in the description of this video and which comes up when you type world's largest dividend discord or just dividend discord in Google. And as is my normal disclaimer, just consider this entertainment and not financial advice. I also want to thank you for taking a moment out of your day to watch this video. Please consider hitting the thumbs up button, subscribing if you haven't yet, and click that bell notification. So back to the subscriber's comment. I think he's right. I don't know this of course, but I see oil is going through significant pain right now due to a double whammy. First was a big oil drop due to the Russia-Saudi Arabia oil price war that started in March of 2020 when the Saudis and the Russians couldn't both agree to reduce oil production to keep prices for oil at a moderate level. This conflict resulted in a sheer price drop in oil over the spring of 2020. Then around the same time the pandemic started picking up steam, which obviously impacted the movement of people and goods, which then tears through the entire oil supply chain, from exploring to extracting to refining to transporting, along with all the support processes like equipment and maintenance and marketing and everything. So it's bad enough to have a significant event like an oil war happening, but it's very rare to then have another significant event like the pandemic hit. Then above all that you have the macro environment which shows renewables are growing and their costs are decreasing and greater concerns for fossil fuel impacts to the environment and all that paints a picture that helps drive oil down to some stock prices which were at 20 plus year lows. Now one thing to recognize is that oil is used in many products beyond just fuel. It's used in the asphalt you drive on, the concrete you walk on, even chewing gum comes from a petroleum derived polymer. Oil is used in the water bottle you might be drinking from. It's used in your pill bottle you might be taking baby aspirin from. Heck, it's used in the manufacture of baby aspirin itself. I don't think most people realize how pervasive oil is used in our society. Yes, fuels for your car is like 40% of oil usage, but what about that other 60%? Well, beyond what I mentioned, what else needs oil? Well, the circuit board in your smartphone, LCD displays using computers and TVs, the elastic on your underwear, the frames of your glasses, rubbing alcohol, carpets, hearing aids, motorcycle helmets, shoes, electrical tape, credit cards, toilet seats, hand lotion, the linoleum on your floors, toothbrushes, luggage, antifreeze, tires, balloons, your comb, tennis rackets, lipstick, life jackets, bandages, artificial turf, perfume, the list goes on and on and on. Fossil fuels have been demonized and I get it, but did you know that natural gas is a non-renewable fossil fuel? Think about that. That stove you're turning on with a pretty blue orange flame or those butane or propane tanks we use when you go camping. All non-renewable fossil fuels. My point? Do I think we need to intelligently use resources? Yes. Should we leverage more renewable energy? Of course. Is the oil industry overly demonized? I think so. I don't think most people, myself included, educate themselves enough to understand the nuances and depths of issues like fossil fuel utilization. Oil is key to our lives, thus I'm a proponent of figuring out how we live in equilibrium with our resources and the environment. We all need to continually evolve to succeed, whether it's a business or as a society. But I think some people need to temper their anti-oil nature and probable hypocrisy and become more educated on it. Just like I think pro-oil zealots need to not put their heads in the ground, figuratively speaking, and recognize that we all need to be continually going on a better, more sustainable path in this world. That path moderates some aspects of our oil consumption but it also recognizes that we'll keep leveraging oil in various other parts of our supply chain probably forever. This doesn't have to be a binary discussion of if you're not with me then you're my enemy. That isn't just bad Star Wars dialogue. I mean, that was, but you get my point. My hope is that oil companies are putting more and more focus on how their business models need to evolve to keep flourishing, as well as how they can better help contribute to the sustainability of the world. Anyways, right now oil is facing headwinds like I've never seen before, so investing in oil can be a very, very risky play in an industry that's been totally beat up. You need to decide if you want to stay far away from oil or if you think now's the time to double down. Okay, let's get started. For reference, the sectors are energy, which I'm calling oil for this video, materials, industrials, consumer discretionary, consumer staples, healthcare, financials, information technology, communication services, utilities, and real estate. 
Let's look at how the oil sector as a whole has been doing in the last five years compared to other sectors into the S&P 500. We see that the S&P 500 has returned about 56%, whereas the energy sector has been the worst performing one at minus 59%, and the best has been tech at 153%. So what is the energy sector? Well, as Investpedia says, the energy sector is a category of stocks that relate to producing or supplying energy. The energy sector or industry includes companies involved in the exploration and development of oil or gas reserves, oil and gas drilling, and refining. The energy industry also includes integrated power utility companies such as renewable energy and coal, but I already did a utilities video so I'm isolating this one to oil. And as a quick refresher, oil companies are usually focused on at least one of the following three areas. Number one, upstream, which is about exploration and production of oil and gas. Number two, midstream, which is about transportation, processing, and storage of their products. And number three, downstream, which is about refining and distribution of petroleum products. When I'm quickly analyzing oil companies, I like to see strong financials and low operational costs, good investment ratings for bonds and credit, and ideally broad diversification of activities and regions and such. Watch my deep analysis oil videos for more details on how I like to analyze and research oil companies, as well as to learn how I see macro trends happening in the oil energy sector. The performance of oil companies is usually fairly tightly coupled to the price in oil. Okay, let's take a look at a screenshot of the industries in the Global Industry Classification Standards Taxonomy to see how it breaks down energy. The two main industries that energy is broken down into are number one, energy equipment and services, and number two, oil, gas, and consumable fuels. Those are then further broken down into sub-industries like oil and gas drilling, oil and gas equipment, oil and gas exploration, etc. If you want to invest in the energy sector as a whole, you could consider ticker XLE, which is the Energy Select Sector Spider Fund, which has been around for a little over 20 years. Energy represents about 1.95% of the S&P 500, though I personally like to hold a bit more in my portfolio. Lately, I've been thinking of investing more at these prices, even with the risks that are present. That doesn't mean you should, I just wanted to share where my mind was these days. Using Dividend Channel's Total Return Strip Calculator, we see that if you had invested 22 years ago, that XLE has only returned an annualized 3%, which significantly underperformed SPY, which returned 6.5% around that same time frame. Okay, let's jump into the poll results. The fifth most popular energy stock in the poll with 15% of voters is ConocoPhillips, ticker COP. ConocoPhillips is one of the six or so super majors. Here's a diagram from Wiki which shows the key ones along with some of their subsidiaries. Conoco operates in 17 countries, with the U.S. being about half their production, and they have reserves of around 5 million barrels of oil, which is mostly petroleum along with natural gas and others, and is 201st on the Fortune's Global 2000 list. They currently have a consensus analyst rating of buy, have four consecutive years of dividend increases, a payout ratio of 76%, a nice 5.9% dividend yield, a high 10.1% three-year dividend CAGR, a PE of 14, and a beta of 1.68. In the last 25 years, ConocoPhillips has a great 9% annualized return with dividends reinvested, which matches SPY during the same period. Let's see what Conoco stock has done in the last 12 months, though if you follow the oil industry, I think you can guess. Of course, many investors wouldn't look at stock movement, and instead will only look focus on trends like cash flow over time, debt over time, etc., and then calculate a reasonable price, but I still like to see how the market has been voting on a stock as well. Conoco is trading around $29 a share, way below their 52-week high of about $67 and above their 52-week low of $21. So some people look at that trend and run away. I personally like to look closer. Let's see how their stock trend looks over a longer period of time. So they were looking pretty solid until 2019-ish. Let's look at their dividend payouts. It turns out that ConocoPhillips slashed its quarterly dividend for the first time in at least 25 years in 2016 as crude oil prices fell. How about their yield trend? We see a fairly static yield trend, though as of late it's gotten more compelling due to the stock price falling relative to the dividend payout. How about their EPS? So regardless of the spike down in 2009, we still see a gradual downtrend, which we don't want to see. How about their shares outstanding? I like what I see here, a gradual decrease down as they buy back their shares. Let's check out how their assets are trending as compared to their liabilities. So we don't like to see this. Assets are trending down over time at a faster rate than their liabilities are trending down. Let's look at how their revenue trend looks. Not what you want to see, but what I'd expect for oil. Let's check out their net income trends. So another trend you don't want to see. The spike down skews the graph a bit, but it's still trending down, unfortunately. Let's take a look at price to free cash flows, where new investors normally like to see higher improving free cash flows, but low share prices, and then existing investors generally like to see high and improving free cash flow and increasing share prices. Low price to free cash flow ratios usually means the stock is undervalued and prices may go up soon. So I like to think that the lower the ratio, the more interesting the stock is to consider taking a position in. 
A lot of people like to focus on PE, which is earnings relative to stock price. But some feel that price to cash flow is a better valuation metric because cash flows can't be as easily manipulated as earnings, which are affected by depreciation and other items. Some companies might be unprofitable because of significant non-cash expenses even though they have positive cash flows. Like PEs, a good ratio depends on the sector the company is in as well as how mature they are. A new growth company usually trades at a higher ratio than a steady eddy company. So smaller ratios are generally preferred as they may reveal a company that is generating ample cash flows that are not yet properly reflected in the current share price. Holding all factors constant from an investment perspective, a smaller price to free cash flow is preferred over a larger multiple. So we see some spikes here which skew some things for Conoco, but generally speaking nothing looks too compelling here. Okay, let's check out their debt. So this is something I like to see, i.e. decreasing debt which is rare for any company let alone oil. Nice. Granted, the metrics only go back to 2019 here. Okay, let's move on. The fourth most popular oil stock in the poll with 17% of voters is British Petroleum, a British multinational oil and gas company. BP set a goal to cut its greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2050, and they plan to increase their investments in renewables 10 times and reduce oil production by 40% from current levels by 2030. So they're a great example of a company that is evolving. They currently have a consensus analyst rating of buy, have zero consecutive years of dividend increases due to a recent cut, a crazy high 8.14% yield and a beta of 0.8. Okay, in the last 25 years, BP has had a terrible 2.8% annualized return with dividends reinvested, which significantly underperformed SPY during the same time period. Let's see how their stock has done in the last 12 months. BP is trading around $15 a share, way below their 52-week high of around $40 and barely above their 52-week low of $14.73. So some people see a lot of risk and thus have voted BP down with their wallets, but some people see this as a buying opportunity. You need to make your own decision if you're a bull or a bear. Let's see how their stock trend looks over a longer period of time. So they're basically flat here. Let's look at their dividend payouts. BP cut their dividend in 2010 and again this year, which hasn't been reflected in this data and which is missing a year, thus the gap. How about their yield trend? Again, we have a slight gap where data is missing, but overall a similar trend, but realize that this doesn't yet reflect the dividend cut BP did this year. How about their EPS? So another weak EPS trend that we would expect, but wouldn't want to see. How about their shares outstanding? Pretty flat overall. Let's check how their assets are trending as compared to their liabilities. So BP has a nicer trend than Conoco here, with its assets growing and growing ever so slightly faster than its liabilities. Let's see how their revenue trend looks. Kind of what you'd expect, only a much nicer trend than Conoco. Let's check out BP's net income trends. So a sad trend to be sure. Let's check out their price to free cash flows. So price are low and free cash flow can't make up for it. Let's check out their debt. BP has been continuing to increase their debt trends, which is more normal for oil companies. Okay, let's move on. The third most popular oil stock in the poll with 38% of voters is Royal Dutch Shell. They are a multinational oil and gas company from the Netherlands and have a good renewable unit including wind, biofuels, hydrogen, and more. They produce around 3.7 million barrels of oil equivalent per day. Now Royal Dutch Shell has two classes of shares, RDS A and RDS B. Sometimes you'll find them as Dash A or Dash B as well as Period A or Period B on various exchanges. The shares have a variety of differences. The A shares are subject to the Dutch dividend withholding tax, which I believe is 15%, and are paid out in default in euros, and they don't have voting rights. The B shares have a UK tax, which I believe are not subject to withholdings and are in pounds sterling, but have voting rights. There are investors who accidentally bought A shares when they wanted B shares, and probably vice versa. Now, I've heard that some people think that dividend withholding doesn't mean much if you're a US citizen, as when you get your 1099B from your brokerage, it should have the withheld dividend amount for you to claim on your taxes but I've never held their shares and I'm not a tax guy, so do your own research. They currently have a consensus analyst rating of hold, have zero consecutive years of dividend increases, a dividend yield which isn't accurately reflected here but is about at 5%, have a crazy low three-year dividend CAGR of 0.5% and a beta of 0.82. Okay, in the last 15 years, the dividend channel says they have data. Royal Dutch Shell has a first for my channel, which is a negative annualized return of minus 1%, which is obviously much worse than SPY. So why do some dividend investors like it? Well, until recently their dividend was solid, so that compelled a lot of DJI folks. Let's see how their stock has done in the last 12 months. This is RDSA, but B is pretty similar. RDSA is trading around $25 a share, way below their 52-week high of about $61 and above their 52-week low of $21. Let's see how their stock trend looks over a longer period of time. So basically flat. Let's look at their dividend payouts. 
Now, earlier this year, Shell cut their dividend payout by 66%, which was the first time they cut their dividend since 1945. That's incredible to me and speaks to how big the two punches in the gut were for them. But as a glimmer of good news, they recently just raised their dividend by 4% after reporting a Q3 profit that beat expectations. So that increase brings the dividend to a third of the 2019 payout. How about their yield trend? Shell's taken some beatings, and with the price drops and div changes, it still is meandering along, though this doesn't reflect the most recent div increase. How about their earnings per share? So another weak EPS trend that we would expect, but wouldn't want to see. How about shares outstanding? Here Shell looks like the least compelling share trends of the bunch. Let's check how their assets are trending as compared to their liabilities. Here we see that Shell has the most compelling assets to liability trends, with assets growing at a faster clip than liabilities. Let's see how their revenue trends look. Shell doesn't look great here, but they do look better than Conoco. How about Shell's net income trends? As one would anticipate, they have a declining trend of net income, which probably won't materially turn around until we see a rebound in oil prices. Let's check out price to free cash flow. So in this case, we're seeing a more compelling price to free cash flow for Shell. Okay, let's check out their debt. So another trend that's not compelling, but not unexpected. Remember, for real due diligence, you want to be looking at the underlying details, not just rely on these graphs, but they are a nice way to get a quick view of things. Okay, let's move on. The second most popular oil stock in the poll with 63% of voters is Chevron. Chevron is one of the successor companies of the famous Standard Oil and operates in more than 180 countries. That's incredible considering there are only 195 countries in the world. Chevron closed its deal to buy Noble Energy in October, expanding its shale operations. The company has invested heavily in the Permian Basin ahead of the coronavirus pandemic and the oil price collapse. That being said, during incredibly trying times like this, you will often see the biggest and strongest companies survive and gobble up smaller companies for pennies on the dollar, making them stronger in the medium term as things rebound. Chevron has also been expanding internationally. In August, Chevron was among the energy companies that announced agreements that are worth up to $8 billion with the Iraqi government. They also signed an agreement in October to sell its natural gas business. They have been aggressively cost-cutting by reducing capital spending by almost 50% and operating expenses by 12%, both of which helped boost their bottom line, though revenue still fell over 30%. Of course, I hate to see anyone lose their jobs, spoken as someone who lost their job once, but I understand Chevron is making moves to keep the dividend in their business alive. Losing a job is part of the reason I believe so strongly in dividend investing. You can't have your financial future tied to your boss, or your company, or whatever. You need to slowly take control, and dividend investing is a great way to do that over time. Now, I like to give my own input on these top five videos I do, and for me, I'd have put Chevron at number one, even though it's not my largest position. I think they have the best financials and strategies out there amongst oil companies. I'd like to see more focusing on renewables from them, but they're still impressive. Okay, let's continue reviewing Chevron stats. They currently have a consensus analyst rating of buy, have an incredible 34 consecutive years of dividend increases, an amazing 7.5% yield, a low 3.5% three-year dividend CAGR, and a beta of 1.3. I think Chevron's window for sustaining their dividend is shrinking quickly, and they need oil prices to return to higher levels soon, else I think they'll have to impact their sacred dividend. Let's hope it all works out, though as my old boss used to say, hope is not a strategy. Okay, in the last 25 years, Chevron has an annualized return of 7.8%, which underperforms SPY, which is at 9.1% over the same time frame. Let's see how their stock has done in the last 12 months. Chevron is trading around $69 a share, way below their 52-week high of about $123 and above their 52-week low of $51. Let's see how their stock trends look over a longer period of time. Here we see Chevron with the strongest trend for stock appreciation relative to the other three. Let's look at their dividend payouts. As you can see, Chevron has the nicest dividend trend here of all of them. In their most recent quarter, Chevron maintained their quarterly dividend, which they actually increased earlier in the year. So while they do have pressure on their dividend, management is still staying true to their shareholders as they feel their cash flow, debt, and future are good enough to do so. How about the yield trend for CVX? We see that Chevron is becoming more compelling from a yield perspective. How about their earnings per share? Another weak EPS trend that we would expect. How about their shares outstanding? So Chevron has one of the nicer trends of gradually decreasing shares, second only to ConocoPhillips. Let's check out how their assets are trending as compared to their liabilities. Here Chevron has the nicest trend of them all. Let's see how their revenue trends look. So similar to others, we see a declining trend. How about Chevron's net income trends? Again, a declining trend that you don't like, unless maybe you're someone who's shorting it, which I'm not a fan of doing. Let's check out price to free cash flow trends. So a middle of the road chart, though hard to interpret due to the spikes. Let's see what we think of their debt. 
Chevron doesn't look great here, though I like that the last few years have been trending in the right direction. Okay, now before I go over the number one position, I want to tell you some other possibilities for this top five list. You could also look into something like Schlumberger, ticker SLB, which is the largest supplier of products and services to the oil industry. They have over 100,000 employees and operate in over 100 countries and have an expertise in lowering the cost of extracting oil. Another play to consider might be something like Valero Energy. They are one of the largest petroleum refiners in the world with a capacity of over 3 million barrels a day. They also have a large ethanol division, but corn prices are going up unlike oil. So that product diversity can help, but also hinder. Beyond Schlumberger and Valero, you could also consider oil and gas pipeline companies. So lots of potential plays out there for you to explore in the oil energy space, though again, anything tied to oil is quite risky during these days, so do your due diligence and only invest money you can afford to lose. Okay, now onto the number one in this list, which is ExxonMobil, ticker XOM. ExxonMobil is the largest descendant of Rockefeller Standard Oil and used to be one of the world's largest companies by both revenue and market cap. They, like many of the oil players, have had their share of criticism and concern from climate change implications to environmental spills. They've also been one of the largest providers of jobs, both in the US and around the world, and are in most of the big ETFs, so if you contribute into a 401k then you're probably an owner. And as I mentioned, I would actually swap Chevron and Exxon in the ordering of this list, even though my large position is with Exxon. But why pick one when you can have two? A threesome is always more fun. They currently have a consensus analyst rating of hold, have an incredible 37 consecutive years of dividend increases, have an amazing 10 plus percent yield, which is either going to be the buy of the century or will be cut soon, have a solid 4.8% three-year dividend CAGR, which is obviously going down right now, and a 19 PE along with a 1.33 beta. In the last 25 years, Exxon has had an annualized return of 5.4%, which underperformed SPY, which is at 9% for the same time frame. Let's see how their stock has done in the last 12 months. Exxon is trading at $32 a share, way below their 52-week high of about $73 and above their 52-week low of about $30. I think you have to go back over 20 years to find Exxon this low. Let's see how their stock trend looks over a longer period of time. So other than what has happened as of late, Exxon looks decent, though not as nice as Chevron. Let's look at their dividend payouts and then talk about their aristocrat status. And that beautiful trend line helps paint the picture of why Exxon is ranked so highly in this list and why so many dividend growth investors love it. But I just recently tweeted that apparently ExxonMobil is keeping the dividend flat for the first time since 1982. That surprises me as I was anticipating a cut given the circumstances. They aren't out of the woods yet though. Stay strong, Exxon and Chevron. Which then begs the question, when will they lose their dividend aristocrat status? My calculations tell me that ExxonMobil can wait until Q4 of 2021 to raise their dividend, and they should remain an aristocrat. How do I know that? Well, take a look at another tweet I did. So I said, to count his consecutively increasing years, look at dividends paid in a calendar year, and if you pay more in a subsequent year, then that counts. So in 2019, if we look at each of the quarters, Exxon paid $3.43. In 2020, they should pay out a total of $3.48. So Exxon can wait until Q4 of 2021 to increase, and their streak remains intact, I believe. So how did I know they paid out $3.43 in 2019? Well, let's go to Street Insider and see what they say. So we can see when and how much dividends were paid out in 2019 and 2020, do the math, and then figure out all that they need to do is raise their quarterly dividend by a penny, heck even less than a penny, in Q4 of 2021, and their aristocrat status remains solid, assuming they keep paying the appropriate amount of dividends until that point. So the various predictions about the pandemic that I've heard have us getting back to normal around that time as a society, so I think it will be close if Exxon can maintain their aristocrat status. I hope they can make it, though I personally still feel it's a decent capital appreciation play right now, even if they cut their dividend 50%, and even a 50% cut would still be a high dividend. Anyways, please follow me on Twitter at GenXDividend if you want to get more real-time updates into dividend stock information that I think you'd be interested in. I'm also thinking that oil would need to get around $50 a barrel for Exxon to breathe a bit easier. How about the yield trend for Exxon? Exxon has the nicest yield trend of the bunch due to their nice CAGR. How about EPS? As one would expect, EPS is trending down. They really need oil to shoot back up. How about their shares outstanding? Nice, Exxon has the most aggressive share repurchase trend, again showing why it's so well liked. That being said, a few years ago, Exxon stopped buying back its shares to help reserve its dividend, which is an insane almost $15 billion payout and one of the largest in the world, though I believe they're behind Apple and Microsoft and maybe AT&T. Let's check how their assets are trending compared to their liabilities. And we see another solid assets to liabilities trend. Let's see how their revenue trends look. So one of the more aggressive revenue declines, which is why the stock has been getting punished. How about Exxon's net income trends? Exxon has a very harsh decline in net income, which they're battling back on by cutting various expenses. 
Exxon boasted its first back-to-back -back quarterly losses this year and is projected to report a first-year multi-billion dollar loss, excluding asset sales or write-downs. Let's check out price-to-free cash flow trends. So this isn't reflecting the latest quarters, or I think Exxon's price-to-free cash flow would look more compelling. Now let's see how debt has been trending, though I think we can guess. A pretty similar trend line to others, with Conoco being the outlier. So hopefully you getting a chance to see some of these metrics of all these oil companies will help you a bit in your next steps of due diligence. Remember, never take any of this as financial advice and always double check things for yourself. So there you have it, the top 5 oil aka energy dividend stocks. Now I want to tell you an inspirational story I found online that I think you'll like. A shop owner placed a sign above his door that said, Puppies for Sale. Signs like this always have a way of attracting young children, and to no surprise, a boy saw the sign and approached the owner. How much are you going to sell the puppies for, he asked. The store owner replied, anywhere from $30 to $50. The little boy pulled out some change from his pocket. I have $2.37, he said. Can I please look at them? The shop owner smiled and whistled. Out of the kennel came Lady, who ran down the aisle of the shop, followed by five tiny teeny balls of fur. One puppy was lagging considerably behind. Immediately, the little boy singled out the lagging, limping puppy and said, What's wrong with that little dog? The shop owner explained that the veterinarian had examined the little puppy and had discovered it didn't have a hip socket. It would always limp. It would always be lame. The little boy became excited. That's the puppy I want to buy. The shop owner said, No, you don't want to buy that little dog. If you really want him, I'll just give him to you. The little boy got quite upset. He looked straight into the store owner's eyes and pointing his finger, he said, I don't want you to give him to me. That little dog is worth every bit as much as all the other dogs and I'll pay full price for it. In fact, I'll give you $2.37 now and 50 cents a month until I have him paid for. The shop owner countered, you really don't want to buy this little dog. He's never going to be able to run and jump and play with you like the other puppies. To his surprise, the little boy reached down and rolled up his pant leg to reveal a badly twisted crippled left leg supported by a big metal brace. He looked up at the shop owner and softly replied, well I don't run so well myself and the little puppy will need someone who understands. So if that story doesn't tug at your heartstrings a bit, then I don't know what will. It teaches us a good lesson about understanding. Speaking of understanding, I wish I understood the stock market more. Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end. Leave me a comment if you did, I'd really appreciate it. These videos take a lot of time and energy for me to create, so please consider hitting the thumbs up button, subscribing if you haven't yet, and click that bell notification. Thank you, I really appreciate your support. If you'd like to directly support me and my message, then consider signing up on Patreon.com, which enables you to a variety of benefits. Also, I have an M1 brokerage referral link in the description of this video. They normally run free cash promotions if you click on a link and then open a non-retirement account and transfer some cash in. Finally, a simple way you could consider supporting me is by clicking on my Amazon affiliate link in the description of this video and then go shopping online. As an Amazon associate, I earned from qualifying purchases. And please join my Dividend Discord server and come chat with me and thousands of other investors. Thanks, and I'll talk to you again real soon. I am not a financial advisor, and these videos are for entertainment, inspiration, and educational purposes only. Investing of any kind involves risk. I am only sharing my opinion with no guarantee of gains or losses on investments.